Welcome to the new Investors My Story. Joining me today is the founder and CEO of Investable, Australia's largest angel investment company. Please welcome Creel Price. <laughs> Creel, thank you for joining us today. Pleasure. The last show of the season. Yeah, save the best for last. I know, exactly. There you go. Well, we hope, no pressure. Maybe. Yes, yes, yes. We'll all look forward to Christmas. You've had an amazingly successful career and a quite varied career. At the moment, you are at the forefront of what you have dubbed entrepreneurs. Can you tell me what the entrepreneurs is? Well, I mean, I originally started calling this the revolution, but actually it turns people off. They think losing everything they hold dear. And I did a bit of um, research around uh, the, the 15th century Italian Renaissance. Yeah. And there was this massive explosion of creativity that sort of underpinned the rest of, you know, Western civilization for the next sort of three or 400 years. And I thought we need that. And so I, I, I think the, the grand masters of today are the entrepreneurs, the Elon Musk and the Steve Jobs uh, rather than the architects of the artists. That's what's going to underpin this amazing change in the, hopefully the next 200 years. So it's really in a response to this rapid, the rapid change in technology and everything. You believe that sort of entrepreneurial spirit is what's going to adapt us to change and move us forward. Correct. Yeah, if we back the right entrepreneurs, particularly the ones that have got the, the right intentions, doing it for good, not evil, I guess. And, yeah. And, and that will underpin, you know, the legacies and, and um, the rapid move forward in technologies that we, we need to, uh, to, to improve as a society. Absolutely. So, so you've kind of dedicated, and I'll go back um, through your businesses, but you've dedicated in your, your career now to fostering entrepreneurship. And you believe that begins right back at childhood. Can you tell me a bit about sort of your childhood and your parents and how, how they instilled these values in you? Sure. Well, I, I grew up in uh, country, you know, western New South Wales, a little town outside of about 30 minutes outside of Cowra. Grew up in a little school with like there was only 15 kids in the school. And, um, you know, we were pretty good at sport because we were considered one of um, New South Wales' most disadvantaged schools, actually. So the oh, government's really? answer to that was rather than give us a better education, they gave everyone a cricket bat and a cricket ball. <laughs> Um, so yes, and, and then I, I guess, um, well, I get to about 11 and, um, you know, we're going through a pretty severe drought, like many of the farmers at the moment and there wasn't a lot of money around. And I was, remember I was up at my grandmother's picking some strawberries at one of those pick your own strawberry places. And I thought, gee, this is what I should do. I could do that and sell the strawberries beside the road, which is which is what I did. And, um, I really wanted to buy a computer back then. It was uh, the uh, computer of choice was the, the Commodore 64. I don't know if yeah, any of you guys have... <laughs> Got one of those, and uh, yeah, so so I started selling these strawberries, and they went like hotcakes. The next year, I put you know double the production, and mum and dad got involved, and then we convinced the school bus driver that if I had them picked and packed by seven thirty when I got the school bus in the morning, he'd deliver them to all the shops around town, and then we grew it again. And before I knew it, there was it became one of the, the 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 biggest cash cows of the of the family for a while when the really? fam when the farm wasn't doing so well. Yeah. So you and you were eleven when you did that. Correct. Yeah. And so by the time you ended, you finished. Um, Set or secondary school, you had founded a number of yeah. little businesses. Yeah, a lot of them around that agricultural sort of sort of scheme. But my my dad, particularly, who's unfortunately no longer with us, but he was such an inspiration around trying to get us to do things. Um, you know, there's so many helicopter parents around. He wasn't like that at all. It was just like, well, if you want to do it, give it a go. Yeah. And I think that really instilled a lot of entrepreneurial spirit in me at a, at a very early age. So, do you believe then for parents fostering that entrepreneurial spirit in children, that's something that they can they can do, or is it something you're born with? No, I think it can be taught, definitely. That, you know, because what are you not, not really teaching entrepreneurship? You're teaching resilience and drive and passion and creativity. Yeah, um, my, yeah. my wife and I, we, we set up a, um, a foundation originally back in uh, 2009 called uh, the Kidpreneur Challenge, which fosters yeah. entrepreneurship in uh, primary schools, as an example. But yeah, sure, every one of those kids, I think there's over 25,000 kids have done the programs um, since then, but they're not, not all going to be entrepreneurs. You don't want them to be all entrepreneurs. No. But they get these new skills that I think is really important for the uh, future of, of work. And they're given a little task, they're given a task to do and they have to build a little business around a problem to solve, is it? Correct, yeah, it's up to them what they do, but typically, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll create, you know, they might, um, you know, do greeting cards as a, as a business, as an example, yeah. one of our, our um, early uh, entrepreneurs did that and she's, she's gone on to be a very successful entrepreneur. Did you know then you wanted to be an entrepreneur or did you go on to uni and study? Something in uni. Yeah, I did go to uni. I, um, I in fact, the, the term entrepreneur wasn't something I even knew that that's what I was doing. Yeah. Um, but these days, it seems that entrepreneur is the new black. When when I, I came up with the concept of the entrepreneur, since everyone that was in two thousand and five, everyone would look at me. He was why? Why do we need more entrepreneurship? But fast forward to today. And the entrepreneurs has absolutely, absolutely come to every government, absolutely. every university, every corporation. They're all trying to be more entrepreneurial. But um, yeah, no, I think 
I, I wanted to do something in business and that's what I did at university, a, a commerce degree, I guess. Okay. Um, and then um, managed to hold down a job for a couple of years in the corporate world. Probably wasn't for me, it's probably fair to say. Yeah. And um, at the 25, started my own business. Yeah, because when you graduated, you graduated in 92, you graduated into quite a tough market, employment Correct, market. Yeah. And at that point, did you decide, you were, you were a couple of years in the corporate world, you went off traveling then for a bit. Correct. And I believe... A little, little bit of a stint in Ireland, I did, yeah. Did you, did yeah. you? What do you think of that? Yeah, no, it's great. I love Ireland. That gave you all your creativity. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's what it. we're talking about. That was the inspiration. There we go. That's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's all we need. <laughs> you read Richard Branson's book and that changed things for you. What was it that, about his book? And what was it, the lessons that you took from that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it was a different era back in, when was that? Um, 1995, I think I read Richard's book. And, um, you know, I'd never heard of Richard Branson before. He wasn't well known in Australia at all. And I was climbing Mount Kilimanjaro at the time. And this English entrepreneur had given me this sort of thing to, 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 to give me some motivation to get to the next stage. And I, I read his book. And what was inspiring about uh, uh, Richard was he'd left school at the age of 15. He, he really, you know, like me, probably, you know, wasn't one of the top students necessarily, but he just got stuck in there and, and created this uh, this virgin empire. And I thought, that's what I want to do. Yeah. Um, and that's when I set myself a goal that I'd come back to Australia and, and start my own business and create the next virgin empire, which didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you didn't do too badly, though. You didn't yeah, do no, too badly. Okay, but, yeah. Well, you said you were climbing Mount Man Kilimanjaro. What were you doing there? It was my 25th birthday and um, I'd never climbed a, a massive uh, high altitude mountain before. So it was pretty naive. We, you know, it was a broke backpacker. So we paid hundred bucks for this tour. We didn't find our guide. We just started walking and had, you know, we used socks for gloves and I tied two socks together to wrap them around my ears because I was getting cold. And uh, I think back, I don't know how I did that. But anyway, so yeah, that's, that's, I guess that was why. And then I set myself the goal. If I could get to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro, I'd go back to Australia and I'd be a millionaire before I was 30. So I had five years to, and, to pull it off. And, and you um, did this. In the nick of time, literally 12 days before my birthday, I, uh, I hit the goal. Because we said that my business partner, that I, Trevor, that we, we joined forces with, we, we then set a new goal when I came back and I shared him about this goal of mine. We, we combined it into a goal that when we made our first net million dollars profit, mm -hmm. that we would go and climb Mount Kilimanjaro together. And then our staff found out about it and we go, okay, we'll take our 10, 10 of our staff with us to go and climb Mount Kilimanjaro together. Yeah. And so that goal actually happened 12 days before my uh, 20, uh, my, my 30th birthday. Excellent. Well mm. done. But you hit the goal of a million dollars before you were 30. Tell me about the company that you founded and how you hit that goal. Yeah, so Blueprint Management Group, I mean, it was, it was founded on more hope than promise, I think, because we didn't even know what business we wanted to be in other than the fact that, we, and that's why we called it Blueprint. We really wanted to come up with the formula for how do you start grow um, businesses. Mm. And so we started with $5,000 in each in capital and thought it was going to be pretty easy, and it wasn't. Um, you know, we had huge amounts of failures early on and iterations, and they call it a pivot now in the startup yeah. ecosystem. We pivoted a lot, um, and it took us a long while to really get traction and get the corporate clients that we, that we needed for our business. But essentially, most of it was based around what you'd call these days, it was really a, a tech, tech business yep. um, around uh, CRM, uh, customer relationship uh, marketing. Yep. Um, so yeah, we did, we were a big outsourcer for a lot of the big banks, that sort, of, uh, that sort of stuff. So you didn't even have an idea, you just knew you had a goal, but I want to be a millionaire before 30. Yep. And when you founded this business, how did you nab that first client? Well, the first big, big contract, shall we say. The first big contract. Maybe you've done a bit of research on me, but uh, we, we, we used to, we called it our Hollywood set, actually. We'd, we'd got this opportunity to pitch to, to some of the executives of Westpac. And we went down there to do this, uh, do this pitch. And, you know, we, at the time, I think we maybe had 10 staff or, in a really crappy little office. And, and we did this pitch. And every time we'd done a pitch before, we, people would say, well, thanks, but no thanks. You know, we're a bank. We don't do business with a tiny little business like yours, which that the world has changed so much these days. Everyone wants to do business with these startups. Small thing, but, yeah. Back in uh, back in that era, certainly not. And um, did a pitch of our lives, and the guy said, "This is exactly what we need." And Trevor and I look at each other and we go, "Oh, this, this is going to be our big break." And the and the guy said, "Well, but there's only one problem." And we said, "Oh, here we go." And he goes, "We have to start immediately." And we go, "Oh, we can start whenever you want." <laughs> yeah, we're there. And he, and he said, well, "Okay, that's great. The first thing we need to do is we need to come out and uh, check out your operation." <laughs> The fact he'd used the word operation <laughs> was we sort of talked ourselves up a little, right? So we'd spent $100 on our whole entire fit out at the second hand auction. And, <laughs> and um, whenever a client had come to our office, we'd never seen of them again, right? So we, we, we got back to, we had like $3,000 left in the bank. We said to the staff, okay, we have to turn this place around by midday tomorrow when they'd scheduled to come around. Yeah. And we hired desks and plants and carpets to cover some of the shabbiness. We got a, um, you know, some computer screens. We couldn't afford the monitors, so we hid the cables to make us look a little bit tech-focused <laughs> and hired all these staff, and then um, we hired a, a new boardroom table, right? So when, when Westpac arrived, arrived the next day, someone had the great idea that um, when all this stuff arrived, we, we broke open to the next-door office, 
and we had the boardroom furniture delivered well, you broke in into the next door. Yeah, where it was vacant, right? So we didn't, we didn't own the office, but we just broke in there, had the board table in there, and um, we did this another amazing pitch at this boardroom we'd never been in before. And, um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, we got, got the business, and they became a client for the next 10 years. So that's sort of, that was our first big break, I think. So you had the, you had the idea. You knew, you knew what you were, was, it was in the head, but you just didn't have the setup at the time. Yeah, yeah, all the reputation, yeah. You sold it 10 years later for 109 million. Mm -hmm. Well done. Thank you. You've sold it just before. Uh, you were on the cusp of like actually thinking about floating it. Uh, Correct, yeah. But you decided not to. And it was a good decision in hindsight. Tell me about how you came to that decision and what, yeah, how you came to that decision. Yeah, I think that, that it's fair to say that we didn't, but the market did. It. We, we, we got the prospectus written up and we had someone underwriting and then all of a sudden the subprime crisis happened just in the middle of that. And that was obviously not a good time to be a small cap on the, on the, on the market. So then we, um, we got a, a number of offers, of which, which these days are called uh, leveraged uh, buyouts. Um, and um, we ended up um, accepting this one. And then our bank, ANZ, came to us and said, what about us? You didn't consider us. And we go, OK, well, we're pretty happy with, because we'd already always set that we wouldn't sell for less than $100 million. So we had $100 million on, on offer. And they, they um, said, well, you know, what about us? And, and so we said, we have to give us a better offer. So they said $110 million and finally came down to 109 That's how, how it sort of happened. And... And, and coincidentally, it, it, when we finally did the sale, it was literally a week before Bear Stearns crashed, which wow. was the defining moment of the financial crisis when all the equity markets shut down and um, you know, we were the last big deal done here in Australia um, for, for a while. So it was, it was great timing yeah. for you. Oh, we picked it. We knew that was going to happen. Of course. <laughs> Your goal was to hit a million by 30, but instead you hit 100 million by 35. Mm -hmm. What would be the one or two things that you've attributed that major success to? Well, I think resilience as well. Like some of that stuff that I grew up with the, around drive and, and resilience and passion. And, and you know, we were, the, uh, we were in a multi-billion dollar industry dominated by US and European players that had very big budgets. The thing that we got right, I think, was, was culture. We, we, just, we just knew that our biggest asset in our, in our company was floating around the hearts and minds of our people. So yeah. we worked. And I think we, we stole a bit of that from Virgin. I think one of the things that the Virgin Group does very well is around culture. Yeah. And I, um, yeah, we sort of replicated quite a few of those things, came up with some of the, the other, other strategies ourselves. And that's really what underpinned the, uh, this massive fast growth that you know, we grew up to 1,000 employees over those 10 years. So Fantastic. I, we couldn't have done that without really great people, but also the structure around the culture that helped us keep yeah. and, and, and motivate the best people. And you spoke about resilience there. One of the things that you hear often coming out of Silicon Valley and all these startups is, well, there's two things. There's the fail fast mm -hmm. and then there's the resilience. How do you balance the two? When do you know to keep going and stick with the course or to drop it and pivot? Yeah, that's a million dollar question, isn't it? But, yeah. um, you know, I think, I think there's definitely some avenues that we, you know, we were the first in market to doing a huge amount of things and we thought that's never going to go anywhere. Messaging, that's never going to work, right? <laughs> Pivoted and then, you know, took yeah. 10 years later and messaging is just everything. Um, so I think you can give up too early, but you don't want to be too much on the bleeding edge. I think if, if, if you're trying to create the market from scratch, it's very difficult without a, a, a really large um, funding budget. So you're better to actually be an existing market and how do you make it better or faster or cheaper or you know whatever. whatever. Think about how do you take customers off someone else rather than necessarily be a market mover. Yeah, yeah. When, in, when you're starting, once you've got a larger budget and you've got a, an existing team, then you can actually maybe do a, a bigger innovation. And during this time, did you have any business mentors or? Yeah, surrounded, you know, we were a couple of 25-year-old guys that had no clue. So, uh, yeah. yeah, we were very fortunate for a long time to, to have some great mentors and, and, and uh, those people are still friends today. Yeah. And they were, you know, very proud of their contribution, seeing us take us from what we were to, to what we became. But um, one of the things that, uh, the nuggets, I guess, that, that came out of that was, once you've worked with someone like that for two years, you actually know what advice they're going to give you before you actually ask them the question. So they are so therefore, teaching. It's my recommendation that you actually turn these people over every two years. Um, so I've now got all these little people I've had all over the last 20 years on my shoulder. And I can ask them questions without having to pay them any money. It's really great. Um, right. So <laughs> and how did you choose or how did yourself and Trevor find each other? And why did you decide that he was going to be the right partner for you? So we, uh, we worked together in finance. It was the first in the corporate job. We started the same week together. They flew me to Brisbane for this training course, met with Trevor, with the new kids, and we became the fiercest competitors against each other for the next three years. In, really? in sales and then in management and that sort of stuff. And honestly, we've never lost that. So even when we got into business, we were somehow, we're always in competition and that's maybe what created this culture as well. We had a very competitive culture that was sort of fun, but but serious. But it's good, but you probably challenge each other and Correct, different yeah. things. I want to talk to you about investable. So 
after you sold Blueprint for 109 million, then how did that feel, by the way? Was, were you then thrown in the air as what's going to happen next? Or did you have a clear vision of what was going to happen? Yeah, well, next? I'd actually already retired 18 months before. I always said I didn't want to do a workout and an earn out. And so we'd done this succession plan. So we'd put a CEO in place. And so therefore, the incoming investor couldn't say, Quill, you need to work for the next two years. Mm. or you need Because I, I wasn't working. So yeah. I'd, I'd already gone off on my mission to found the entrepreneur and become a social entrepreneur around the world and stuff. So yeah, so that, that was made it pretty easy. But yeah, getting the um, the check on that day was was quite, you know, having grown up in, in such humble uh environments was, was quite interesting. I remember going home at the time and my wife uh, rang me up and she said, oh, you know, we're having Indian, can you get some Papadams? So I was about to pull into the uh, store to buy some Papadams and I thought, fuck, I can actually afford to go to the Indian restaurant and just order pop Papadams. So, <laughs> so that's what I did, yeah. So, that, that's, so it's a it's life changer. A, it's the little things, it's yeah. the little things. <laughs> did your interest in Social entrepreneurship have come before investable. So you have you found it investable as well. Which came first? Yeah, the, the social side of things was very much part of our culture as well. You know, we did these adventure trips every year, the award winners, most companies you'd get a gold watch. In our company, you'd get flown to Africa or somewhere to do a, you know, something with an orphanage, or we'd do the amazing race China or something pretty crazy. And that really in, in, engendered this uh, real how do we give back? Um, and yep. that, and that, so when I retired from business, that's what I wanted the entrepreneurs to do is, is how do we actually create, use entrepreneurship to make the world a better place? And I was very fortunate to you know, work through Africa and Cambodia and Papua New Guinea and these places and bring entrepreneurship um, in those places. One of your methodologies is this decisionship. Correct. Yeah. So Richard Branson actually uses this in his curriculum. Center for Entrepreneurship. Yeah. So I worked for like, a, you know, back and forth for like seven years with the Branson Center in South Africa that... I was, I was fortunate to meet, meet Richard and he sort of saw what I was doing and, and got me involved in that, which, was, which has been great. Um, and that's how I, I really came to understand this, the importance of when you're teaching entrepreneurship, you know, you can, you know there's, there's so many strategies I think you can, you can think of, but if you can pump it up really as an entrepreneur, your job is to make decisions. You yeah. know, sometimes they're minor decisions Absolutely. and you can just make them like that. Sometimes yeah. major, maybe hiring a new staff member, or sometimes they're mega where it's about, you know, should I stay with my business partner or not? Should I expand to Europe or not? You know, so what? that's, that's your And you think that's one of the key things for a successful entrepreneur is make, being able to make good decisions. I know one of your courses is go to climb in a mountain. What can you learn about making decisions from climbing a mountain? Has there been any good experiences on those? Well, yes, I think so. The, well, I think, first of all, there's, there's, there's a business owner and an entrepreneur. Okay. The difference between the two is a business owner loves the business industry that they're in, and then they can see themselves working in that for the next 50 years and handing it down to their kids. Yeah. Okay. An entrepreneur is someone that actually has, uh, you know, can't really focus on, they, they have what I call the entrepreneur's curse. They, have, they, have, they can't focus for very long. So I think there's a maximum of seven years these people have got. And to the, you on need, one business? Yeah. Okay. So to, you need to start... You need to grow and you need to exit your business. Otherwise, you'll do what I did for a while. We took 10 years and you can start to turn your business into a conglomerate of half-finished ideas because you're trying to always do these new things when there's, there's so much opportunity in the business you're already in. So mm. that's, that's what differentiates an entrepreneur from a business builder or, or a business owner. Yeah. And so I think what we learn about climbing a high-altitude mountain is uh, most people die on a mountain, not on the way up they die on the way down. They might get summit fever and don't leave enough energy in the tank or light in the day to actually make it down alive. And I see that so many times with entrepreneurs. They build these amazing businesses yeah. and then they just fall off a cliff and they end up with nothing. They haven't, they haven't yeah. thought about succession or they haven't sort of thought about exit early enough because you can't just wake up and go, oh, I want to sell my company today. It's a two-year process. Mm. So you've got to leave enough energy and mountaineering is exactly the same. You've, you've really got to think about that early. And so, you're t so when you do that course, that's, that's what you're applying those strategies and that methodology. Well, that's, that's people one, of things, well, one of the things that we've, we've pioneered in entrepreneur education, and that was, I'm very fortunate, around the Branson Centre that I had to because a lot of these entrepreneurs had, had grown up in apartheid South Africa, hadn't had a formal education couldn't teach them out of a textbook. So I, I created this experiential learning program. So we took them out to this game park and to learn yeah. about business models. I said, like a business model is a recipe. You know, it's just how do you find something you can you know, replicate over and over. So we'd do this master chef competition around a campfire. And then we'd, do, we'd climb a mountain to teach them about the stages of, of business that you actually go through. Yeah. And there's eight distinct stages from startup to, uh, to exit. So with Investable, so you invest in early startups. One of the keys is to find someone before, find a company that, uh, start up before everybody else is talking about it. Mm -hmm. And you've proven yourself in this area because you've invested in a couple of the big unicorns like Canva. How do you pick the, the company that's investable? 
Well, for us, it's always about people. You know, I think at the early stage very much, you know, sure, they've got to have a passion and a good business idea. And usually it's, it's cooked a little bit, but there's, there's not a lot of revenue and definitely no profit. So yeah. you're backing people. And so we've got a number of uh, activities. We use our pro, like the uh, boot camp that I talked about, the experiential to actually test people. Yeah. We, we uh, have a number of uh, tools that we use. For instance, we've got a, one that looks at 48 attitudes and motivations called Fingerprint for Success that uh, not only works on, is someone got what it takes to be an entrepreneur. When you're looking at two business partners like Trevor and myself, you're looking for complementary skills yeah. to, uh, to actually get the mix. So there's okay. some things we look at. And then we, we look at, do we think they've got that resilience and drive? They're obviously going to be bashed continually. Yeah. Will they be able to get back up and, 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 and be safe with our investors' money? Yeah. And what's the biggest risk involved in investing in these? Well, losing all your money. It's a yeah. pretty big risk. Yeah. But, um, but, <laughs> but I, I think it's, it's bigger than that because obviously you want to make sure that you protect the founders. Found, you know, startup founders have five times the, the mental health issues as the standard population. So it's, it's, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a pretty stressful thing to be involved in. So we're very hands-on in supporting startups as well as just giving them finance. How do we help them get very much to the next stage? That's, that's been our success over the 80 investments or so that we've done. Yeah. What was it that you saw on Canva? Well, I think it was um, Trevor can, can take the credit on that one. He wrote the first fifty thousand dollar check from an Australian investor in, uh, in, really? that, in that business, which was uh, which was which was very lucrative. <laughs> he's, he's smiling now. Yeah, definitely. But um, I think if I if I look at those founders now, they, they are just they're not about just building their company and, and making you know themselves and investors a lot of money. They're building a business because they want to change the world, and they've got such a social purpose as well. We, we do a few indigenous programs, and they've been so. Uh, caring and, um, and and complimentary with their time. Mm. Um, that's the sort of founders we want to back. That's not to, you know, it's back to the entrepreneurship principles. How do we back people that want to change the world for good, not evil? We've got a lot. I've just heard we've got lots of questions coming in. Okay. Um, I'm going to flick now to these little questions. Okay. The first one. This is from Tony. Which investments do you regret the most, if any? Yeah, well, there's one that really comes to mind. The um, I won't mention the company by name, but they, they did blow up. I mean, you know, and, and it's natural. In, in early stage investment, I think we've had around about 12% of our portfolio blow up, and that's you just factor that into the uh, to the returns. But uh, this particular one, we only met one of the founders, and we didn't do our assessment on both founders. And when we finally met the second founder after we'd invested, we thought, this is never going to work. Um, Why? And we were right. We're just the type of person that, that he was. What type he of didn't listen. You, know, you asked me the question before uh, about mentors. Yeah. And we're a very hands-on investor. We don't invest in people that aren't coachable. And this guy's absolutely, he knew everything, wouldn't listen to any, anyone. And when you, when you start with that in, a, in an industry he hadn't been in for very long, Honestly, it was always going to be a, a house over. of cards. Yeah. So, so when you say somebody is not coachable, what type of person is not coachable? And not who doesn't listen? Yeah. Well, I think it's just about saying first of all, there's two parts of coachability. Is actually you actively seek coaches and mentors. Yeah. Um, and secondly, when you actually hear some advice, you go, I don't have to agree with it, but I'll, I'll, I'll take that. I'll, I'll, I'll actually think that through yeah. rather than just arguing the, uh, the the point. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. This is from Paul. Since selling your business, what business achievement are you most proud of? Um, well, I think um, the, the work that, uh, that and, and, and honestly, T Tanya, my wife, she does the, the, the bulk of the work around the, um, her, her business, Entropolis, that now supports the uh, Kidpreneur Initiative. Oh, yeah. it's, it's, you know, inspiring the next generation is just being involved in that. And the, I think over a thousand schools have now taken up that program. It's just so exciting to think about what this new generation of kids are going to be like because they're so wide socially. So if you can give them the business skills, I think it's going to, you know, the world is going to be a so much better place if, if you put them in charge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this is from Elizabeth. How can we as humans remain relevant in the workforce as automation and advancement of technology progresses? Yeah, I mean, there's all obviously scary things um, that, that technology can take jobs and that sort of stuff. But, but typically, I think it's a, it's a good thing, uh, technology, particularly if, if, if you get the right founders that have got the right vision. Mm -hmm. um, but there is, um, you know, one of my favourite books is called The Logic of Failure. Um, and, and I think that's the, the biggest danger that, that, that law and regulations don't catch up with some of the technologies fast enough and they can be, uh, can be abused. So as humans, I think we can't always just rely on governments. I think we have to actually vote with our feet with, with, with companies and governments. How do we actually be active in uh, our consumerism behaviours in order to be able to pick the right companies and not just the cheapest companies exactly? That's yeah. what I'm you mentioned, so just when you mentioned that book there, that was one of the questions I wanted to ask because Branson was a big influence on you and then you said The Logic of Failure. Are there any other books that you would recommend to either business leaders who want to foster entrepreneurship in their company or um, budding entrepreneurs? 
I meant to say my own book here, but I, th I think it's um, <laughs> the, the one thing to win at the game of business, but I, I think it's getting a bit old what now. Is your, what's well, it's, it's called the one thing to win at the game of business, but it was written in 2012, and honestly, the, you know, it's still it's around decision ships, su super important lessons, but um, there's probably a, a version, another version coming out in, in the future. But the, um, one of my favourite books is, is, um, is called The E-Myth by Michael Gerber, um, E standing for entrepreneurial myth, that people think that they start their own business in order to be able to you know, do what they want, when they want, with the people they want to do it with, the freedom and that sort of stuff. But mm. it's actually the opposite, that the business can actually trap you in there. And rather than start a business in what you're passionate about, um, you know, so for instance, you love uh, hang gliding, you start a hang gliding business. So all day you're taking tourists up in the hang glider in, 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 you know, within a few months, you hate hang gliding, right? So it's my belief that if you're an entrepreneur, you should love the game of business mm -hmm. um, and be good at that. So whether, whether you're in uh, garbage or you're in um, you know, airlines, you still love it. It's just about how do I actually be the best I can be at this? And then you can move between sectors rather than necessarily have to stick to one thing. Right. So, for sure. so like learn the business like concepts more so than actual yeah. trying to come up with yeah, I, could, I could be happy in any type of business. I could be a funeral director business. And as long as there, there was an opportunity to disrupt and, and yeah. do something different that no one had ever done before, uh, you know, bodies on moon or whatever it might be, the, um, you know, yeah. I'd, I'd be excited. <laughs> Excellent. Um, this is from Gaz. What's the next industry ripe for disruption in Australia, do you believe? Well, we've been saying that about the financial services industry for 20 years, but the uh, the Royal Commission, I think, has proven that, uh -huh. and, and that's definitely ripe for uh, for yeah. some massive change. Um, you know, we've got things happening in blockchain and crypto, obviously, but but equally around the financial advice industry, it still doesn't serve customers. Um, and I think, honestly, the government's got a lot to uh, answer for that because more regulation doesn't necessarily mean it's better for customers. It could mean it's just more paperwork, and that doesn't make you a, a more informed consumer either. Yeah, so banking would be the, the area so. that you'd yeah. go to. Um, what's the next, oh, what's the biggest problem facing the world right now, and what can we do to make it better? Well, one of my partners in crime is in the audience today, Lauren. She's, she's uh, definitely helped Investable become a lot more greener and uh, have a, uh, an awareness of climate change. And you know, it's been over a number of years, but it's certainly it's, it's hitting peak uh, momentum at the moment. I think really, that's, yeah. you, know, you, can't, you, you really can't go past um, how do you look at clean energy? How do we look at new technologies? How do we change our buying habits? Um, you know, so you know, I, think, I think that's the real focus over the next decade. Yeah, for sure. At your level of business, what areas would you like to upskill in? And do you feel that, no, do you still feel that you need to grow? Always growing. And I think actually Richard Branson is a really great example of that. Like he, when you, when, when you, when you meet him, you might not have seen him for a year. He's just so interested in, in what you're doing, not necessarily about you. It's all about, I want to, I want to sap you for information all the time. He's learning all the time. He's, yeah, he's yeah, seven yeah. years of age and, and he's doing that. And I think that's a good role model for me is, yeah, I'm always learning about how do I be better at business and better business models? Um, and how do I be better at leader? Um, all of those things you can always be learning for sure. When we talked earlier on about that Richard Branson book, when you're traveling around backpacking, changing your life, then you went on to meet him. And then, then he described you in his book as the true entrepreneur, a true sense of an entrepreneur. Sure. And what was some of the things that then you learned from him? And that, like, how did you strike up that relationship? Well, first of all, he's just, he, he, he's, he's interested. A lot, a lot of famous people you meet, is, uh, they meet you, but they're sort of looking around, is there someone else I need to speak yeah, to? Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm doing this as a chore. He, yeah. he loves people and loves information and loves technology and um, he's, he's really interested. So I think that's important. He's, he's got this phenomenal memory for names. So he'll, he'll remember a conversation you spoke about 12 months ago and, 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 uh, and that's a little bit, you know, it's a good people skill to yeah, actually have. Sure. So, um, and, you know, he's, he's always... Um, you know, having fun as well. I think the important thing about business is it can get a bit serious sometimes. You've got to bring that fun element in and that particularly the, 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 the millennials that are coming through as employees, it's got to be more than just uh, careers and ambition. How do we actually add that other dynamic, which is, you know, careers are a huge part of our um, lives these days. How do we make it more fun and rewarding? Yeah, for sure. Because you've been to Necker Island a couple of times. A couple of times, yeah. Was it fun? Well, what goes on at Necker stays at Necker. Fair I think enough. The, um, <laughs> What's the next mountain or business goal you're working towards? Well, I always, New Year's Eve, I always go on New Year's Day, typically, but this time I'm doing a couple of days before New Year's Eve, is I go and climb a, a mountain and I set my goals. So I spend two, three days up on, you know, a bit zen up on a mountain, setting my goals for the next year, next five years. Love it. And so I'm uh, climbing Mount Barney in uh, Queensland, one of the highest mountains in Queensland in, um, in um, you know, late, later this month. 
So that's the, the next mountain. Next business goal is I, I really want to bring something to bear around um, talent and how do we around actually what? talent the people? How do yeah. how do we actually? There seems to be this disconnect that, that we've got the corporate world and we've got the sort of sexy startup and tech world. Yeah. I want I want to. How do we actually bring those two things together to get more people involved in both? And I think that will actually uh, that, will, that will actually help innovation. Um, in, you know, and will be created. And will that be working with business leaders to develop that within their companies and? Yeah, well, there's, there's, there's certainly a, a concept that I've got. I won't, I won't, I won't, won't okay. go into it deeply here, but, it's, <laughs> but it, it, it brings in uh, community as well. Yeah. So how do you actually, how do you bring in um, new age living to um, your, your workplace? And I think that's the, that's the combination of the two because it's, I think we always think living, we think work, but there's a real opportunity to actually to work out together. how you bring it together. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Creel. That's all we've got time for, but it's been an absolute pleasure to have you here today. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Creel Price. Thank you.